Welcome to Real Chemistry. I'm Dr. Morris, and today we're going to be talking about the de Broglie relationship. I'm pretty sure that's a butchering of the pronunciation, but at American universities we call it the de Broglie relation. And basically what it is, is a way to calculate the wavelength of particles, which is a little weird, right? We're used to thinking about wavelength for light or for water, but it turns out particles actually have wavelengths too. So the first thing we're going to do in this video is talk about why we think particles have wavelengths, and the second thing we're going to do is show you how to calculate those wavelengths using the de Broglie relation. So first, why do we even think particles have wavelengths? Well, one telltale sign that you have a wave is something called a diffraction pattern. And a common way to generate a diffraction pattern, and probably historically one of the most important ways, is the two-slit experiment. And that's what you see a schematic of in the bottom left. Here you have light coming in and hitting this screen, and then going through these two slits. That's why it's called the two-slit experiment. And then the light travels over to this screen on the far side. You'll notice that if I follow the path of light all the way to the screen from the top slit and all the way to the screen from the bottom slit, those distances traveled will actually be a little different. And that means if you think about the peaks and the troughs of your waves, they're not going to overlap nicely at every point on that screen. Sometimes the peaks and peaks are going to overlap, and then you'll get a bright spot. Sometimes the trough and peak will overlap, and then you'll get a dark spot due to destructive interference. So after you put light through a two-slit experiment, you get out a diffraction pattern, which looks like this. You have a series of bright and dark spots due to that constructive and destructive interference. So that sort of makes sense that light could do that, because we know light's a wave, and we know it has peaks and troughs. The weird thing is that it turns out that electrons actually make the same diffraction pattern, because they turn out to actually be described by a characteristic wavelength. So what we're going to do in this video is talk about how do we know what the wavelength of a particle is? So, sure, a particle has a wavelength, but what is the wavelength of a particle? And that's what the de Broglie relationship tells us. It tells us that the wavelength of a particle, which we use lambda as the symbol, just like for light, is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum of that particle. And you'll recall that momentum can be calculated by the mass times the velocity of something. So lots of times when you're doing these calculations, you'll take the mass of an object, multiply by the velocity, that gives you the momentum, and then calculate the de Broglie wavelength. So what does that look like? Well, a question might look like this. What is the wavelength of an electron moving at 3.25 times 10 to the fifth meters per second? And we want to know that wavelength in nanometers. Well, it's a very weird concept that the electron has a wavelength, but it turns out to be a pretty straightforward calculation. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the momentum of our particle. And down here, we're told that momentum is equal to mass times volume. So the very first step is just, not volume, I'm sorry, mass times velocity. Mass times volume would be pretty strange. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate momentum, which is mass times velocity. The mass of an electron turns out to be 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31st kilograms. And we know the velocity is 3.25 times 10 to the fifth. And if we plug that in our calculators, we'll get out a momentum of 2.96 times 10 to the minus 25th. And the units of Momentum turned out to be kilograms, meters per second. It's important that whenever you calculate the mass for your de Broglie wavelength, that you put in your mass in kilograms. That's the SI unit for kilograms, and there's secretly kilograms in the Planck's constant, which we're about to use. So if you don't put your mass in kilograms, you'll get the wrong answer. All right, so we have the momentum. So step two just says calculate the wavelength, and we have that equation right there. So we know that our wavelength is equal to Planck's constant over our momentum. Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th. Actually, as the units of joule seconds. And we're going to divide that by our momentum calculated above, 2.96 times 10 to the minus 25th. When we plug that all into a calculator, we're going to get out 2.237 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. Now remember, we want that answer in nanometers, and the reason we want to do that is just so we can easily compare it to wavelengths we know of, like say the wavelength of light or something like that. You don't always do that in these problems, but it's a nice thing to do to think about what this wavelength is compared to say visible light. So to convert to nanometers, we just take our answer in meters, and we multiply that by 10 to the ninth nanometers 
over one meter. And so that conversion is going to give us 0 0.224 nanometers. So that is our wavelength of our electron in nanometers. So you can see that it's a fair bit smaller than the wavelength of, say, visible light, which might be four or 500 nanometers. But it's still significant, and that's why you can see that diffraction pattern in the two-slit experiment. You have uh, positive uh, parts of the wave and negative parts of the wave that can constructively and destructively interfere. So this is weird. Why don't we look around the world and see particles and notice that they have a wavelength? Well, it turns out the wavelengths get smaller and smaller as objects get bigger. So one way we can see that is to do a calculation for a larger object. So say, a baseball. So this problem asks, what is the wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength, of a 0.15 kilogram baseball thrown at 100 miles per hour? And I've gone ahead and converted that to meters per second, which is about 44.7 meters per second. So we're going to do the same calculation. This time, though, I'm just going to go ahead and algebraically remember that momentum is mass times velocity, and that our de Broglie relationship tells us that Planck's constant over momentum is wavelength. And I'm just going to plug this into the bottom, and I'm going to say, okay, really all I need to do is Planck's constant divided by mass times velocity. And that way we can just do this calculation in one step. So first we plug in Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th. And now we need to plug in the mass. And remember, you always have to plug in the mass in kilograms, since we're using Planck's constant, that has, secretly has kilograms in it. So that's the mass of our baseball. We were told it's 0.15 kilograms, so we plug that in. The last thing we need to do is plug in our velocity. So our velocity is 44.7 meters per second. When we go ahead and plug that into a calculator, we're going to get out something that looks pretty small. 9.88 times 10 to the minus 35th meters. All right, so that is really, really, really small. It's a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a meter. Totally negligible compared to the size of the baseball. So although particles do have a wavelength, it gets totally irrelevant by the time objects get large. And this is why the de Broglie wavelength is only really important in quantum mechanics, where you're thinking about small objects and those wavelengths become really important. If you have any questions about the de Broglie relation, please go ahead and ask them below. You can also subscribe to my YouTube station to get updates. Uh, thanks for watching.